So this is a bit of a problem. When we have the best high technology, where you have these micrometers and the best telescopes, and it's still at the hairy edge of measurability, and people claim they got it, maybe some people thought they didn't. So if you've given it your best shot with the best equipment, um, and you can't quite measure it, what do you do? How can you improve things? Well, you can improve things, I would say, naturally. Instead of trying to build a bigger telescope, you let space in the universe do it for you. So we, as they use the eclipse, right, they were able to use the position of the moon going in front of the sun to measure it at the exact same time. That solves the timing problem in two different places. That solves the distance problem, able to get a very and still accurate measurement to the moon. Now, in space, we're luckily we have another event, and that is called the transit of Venus. And this little black dot captured from a more recent transit of Venus is uh, this millennia is Venus moving across the surface of the sun. And this is something that another astronomer, Edmund Halley, published in a paper in 1716, saying that if you could measure the transit of Venus from multiple places all over the length and breadth of the Earth, you can work out the timing by seeing when it appears to enter and leave the disk of the sun. Because it takes hours for this to happen. It doesn't take about 10 minutes. It takes a yep. long time. So you realize when it first touches the edge of the sun and when it's fully inside, and then when it leaves it again. And if you then measure it from multiple different places in the north and south and east and west all over the Earth, so you're getting different angles in the same thing, you're solving the timing problem because it's set by space. And you can very, very precise angles because you can actually see it relative to the disk of the sun. So that gives you your reference. The sun is it, using the sun as a reference to work out how far away Venus is. So you have to go pretty much though all around the world to really try and nail this technique. Yes, but in principle, it could work really well. And Halley worked this out, he said, in 1716. The trouble was the next transit was not until 1761. So unlike eclipses, which happen every year or two around the Earth, you're waiting 50 to sometimes 100 years, in this case, a better part of a century, to, for it to happen. Yes, it's like 40 years after he published this. And they occur in pairs, typically a few years apart, and then you can wait another century for the next pair. So if they didn't get it in 1761 and 1769, they're going to have to wait until the middle of the 19th century, another 100 and something years later. So they really had to capture it at this time. So you're really talking about planning a big worldwide astronomical experiment. And this is kind of like the first big international science. Um, and it was um, quite harrowing stories, to be honest. I mean, we think we have it bad as astronomers nowadays when our grant application gets turned down, um, or we can't go to a conference because of COVID lockdown or something like that. But we're talking about a whole level of pain much beyond that here. Because there had to obviously be multiple people involved. There had to be multiple telescopes in multiple locations. And it's not like you can just hop over there tomorrow to go do you it. You can't jump on a plane. That's right. Uh, can't do remote observing over the internet, exactly. You had to get your highly fragile equipment and your, put them on a sailing ship and sail for typically months to years to get to some remote part of the Earth to do this. And then get back. And get back with your data and hope it wasn't cloudy when you got there. And so there are so many amazing stories of this. I mean, there's these the British surveyors, Mason and Dixon, famous to Americans for surveying the Mason-Dixon line, which they did later. This is an earlier job of them. <laughs> the trouble was, in 1761, a war had just broken out between Britain and France. That would cause a problem with your astronomical measurements? They were 24 hours out on their journey to the Far East with their, on their sailing ship when a much bigger French ship caught up with theirs and started firing on it. So they were apparently hunkered down in the basement while listening to screams as cannonballs. Uh, they, they actually won the battle, but their ship was mostly wrecked and to go back to port. So that pretty much ended their contribution to Didn't the Didn't actually. Project. They thought they'd have enough of this. So I'm not going to do this anymore, but their, their bosses said, no, you are. Get back on another ship and go out, which I, I think, don't think they were too enthusiastic about. I can only imagine. But they went out. They discovered they were going to be late, so eventually they managed to talk their way into the Dutch colony of the Cape and measure the, okay. from, measure from the Cape. Because they got the only, actually, only data from the Southern Hemisphere for this. Because I guess it, it really, ultimately, as long as there was multiple spots on the Earth covered, that's really all you needed. And you need as many spots as possible. Yeah. This guy, uh, I'm not going to try and pronounce the French name, Jean-Baptiste Dottoroche or something like that, he um, decided to do it, measure it from Siberia. Yep. And uh, the trouble is when they arrived in this remote part of Siberia, they just had a whole bunch of floods, and the locals blamed the floods on witchcraft from the strange foreigner arriving. So he had to have a guard of Cossacks to protect him from the locals who would attempt to destroy the strange magical activity going on. Fair enough. Have you ever got of Cossacks when observing? Look, look, I haven't needed it luckily yet, uh, and I plan not on having it anytime soon. Yep. Um, 
the most terrible story, so terrible they've actually made an opera about it, <laughs> is this guy, again, uh, Le Gentil, I'll say. Um, so a French person, he went out, um, took a ship to the uh, Ile de France, or Mauritius as it's now called, yep. where he probably met a whole bunch of my ancestors who lived on this island at the time. And uh, they, um, then he was going to set sail for Pondicherry in India, which at the point in time was a French colony. Yep. Um, the trouble was, uh, they got, got a boat and they told, oh yeah, it'll be no trouble, we'll get there well within a month, give you a month's time to set up. But the boat got becalmed yeah. and washed around and ended up doing a tour of the entire Indian Ocean under contrary winds. Eventually arrived off Pondicherry with only like a few days to spare before the eclipse. It was going to be very tight to get his telescope. He discovered it had just been captured by the English and they couldn't land. So they had to sail back to Mauritius. And on the way back, he had a lovely view of the eclipse from a rocking sailing ship, which meant he couldn't make any good observations. And it was really hard to pinpoint exactly where you were at the time. So he then decided, rather than go back to France, he's going to wait eight years in the Far East and observe the next one. He wasn't going to take <laughs> any more risks. That's some endurance for an astronomical experiment, I'll tell you. But I guess that is the benefit, right, of having the two events as you can measure it twice in relatively recent time. So he went off to the Far East and had an observatory set up, but then he got orders from France no, you've got to measure it back from Pondicherry, which at the point had been recaptured by the French. So he packed up his observatory, sailed back, got there way in advance, set up the observatory. I'm going to really observe it. For the entire previous four months, it had been clear and sunny. And then on the day of the eclipse, the monsoon came in, the rain started, and it was completely clouded out and got nothing. Now, I recognize that problem, being set up in advance and getting clouded out the one day you need your observations. <laughs> but it wasn't the problem. So he apparently was, strange enough, deeply depressed after this, couldn't get himself out of his bed for the two weeks after that, but then eventually he decided to set sail home. Unfortunately, he's caught in a major storm, um, stranded on the island of Reunion for a while, eventually arrives back in France like 10 years after leaving it to discover that all his letters home had gone missing and he'd been declared dead. His house had been sold, all his property had been re revoked his membership, his wife had remarried. I'll take my remote <laughs> observations, let's say that. But it actually ended up kind of okay that he uh, was able to get remarried, had a child, was reinstated and everything, Relative, got some of his I money guess, back. Yeah. But uh, uh, I think this sort of discouraged most people from persisting with astronomy. But I guess, I mean, this is the point of the effort that had to go in to measure it. I guess why it was such a fundamental question, right? I mean, there are multiple people going around to go through pretty dire situations to do this one fundamental measurement, yep. that is, how far away is the sun? In fact, Dautorosh had the worst thing, because he went back to measure the second eclipse. This time, instead of being guarded by Cossacks in Siberia, he measured it from the Baja California in Mexico. Okay. Um, it wasn't Mexico at the time, the yeah. Spanish colonies. And the trouble was, as they were all waiting there, for the, uh, they all started uh, di dying, probably from typhoid. And about... 80% of the crew were already dead by the time the eclipse. He was still alive, but severely ill. He managed to make the observation, and they had to wait to get the accurate timing. They had to measure the precise position of the moon a week later. Yep. And he managed to stay alive long enough to make that observation, then he died. And the only one or two surviving people managed to take the records back to France. <laughs> But the most famous person involved in this was Captain James Cook on the ship The Endeavour. This is a, a modern replica of The Endeavour. Um, and this is famous. He made the measurements from uh, Tahiti, a place called Point Venus to this day, uh, but more famous for what happened afterwards which was when he sailed along New Zealand and the east coast of Australia, quotes, discovering them for Europe. But by combining all these observations, uh, some, a lot of the observations were not as good as they thought they were going to be. They were hoping mm. to get 1% precision. They only achieved 3% precision. But nonetheless, for the first time, they had a reliable 3% distance to the sun. Which is, I mean, a remarkable step compared to what they had had previously. And this distance was staggeringly large, 150 million kilometers. So we know when the moon is around 400,000 kilometers, this is much, 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 much further away. 400 times further away than the moon, which is already very far away. Which then immediately starts to tell you how big the sun is relative to the moon. Yes. 